sure to welcome all of you here today and those on C-SPAN uh, viewing this forum. Let me note for the record and for any government officials watching us on C-SPAN that Library Director Tom Putnam and other federal employees of the Kennedy Presidential Library here today are here as public citizens and not in their official roles while the federal government, the National Archives, and the Kennedy Library remain closed to the public due to a lack of congressional appropriation. I will spare you my personal commentary on the situation, <laughs> only to say that we all hope this is resolved quickly so that the nation's memorial to President Kennedy can open soon. Let me begin by acknowledging the generous underwriters of the Kennedy Library Forums, lead sponsor Bank of America, Raytheon, Boston Capital, the Lowell Institute, the Boston Foundation, and our media partners, the Boston Globe, Xfinity, and WBUR. We also want to thank our neighbors here at the University of Massachusetts Boston and the McCormick Institute for coming to our rescue by offering to host today's event after they learned that Congress had closed the doors to the Kennedy Presidential Library. Much work had gone into the planning of this conference, which is co-sponsored with the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study at Harvard University. And we are very pleased to have found a way to keep our initial schedule and to share with the wide audience this remarkable and not widely known story in our nation's history and in the presidency of John F. Kennedy. In August, the Kennedy Presidential Library hosted a similar conference with Congressman John Lewis and others to mark the 50th anniversary of the March on Washington an event that historians deem the most significant political demonstration in our nation's history. As you know, the marchers gathered that day in support of new civil rights legislation proposed earlier that summer by President Kennedy with the hope that Congress would swiftly pass those measures and the White House would sign them into law. The March on Washington epitomized the use of massive grassroots organizing to broaden the rights and opportunities of those marginalized in our society. During President Kennedy's term of office, an alternative strategy was used to expand the rights of women, especially those in the workforce. This approach did not re rely on mass demonstrations or public lobbying from outside interest groups. The focus instead was on a few key activists who worked within the administration to change laws and raise social consciousness. While these initiatives helped spawn the modern woman's movement as we have come to know it, the changes made during the Kennedy years occurred before groups like the National Organization of Women and other feminist organizations were even formed. October 11th, 2013, this past Friday, marked the 50th anniversary of the report issued by President Kennedy's Commission on the Status of Women which was appointed by President Kennedy in 1961 and chaired by Eleanor Roosevelt until her death in November of 1962. In fact, the report was released on what would have been Mrs. Roosevelt's 79th birthday to honor her contribution to this historic effort. We are pleased to gather a half century later to look back at the history and legacy of President Kennedy, his commitment to advance the cause of women's rights, and the commission he personally appointed to help spur this movement. Whenever we host historical conferences of this type, we also like to conclude with a panel that looks at these issues in a contemporary context, and in this case, at the challenges facing women in American society today. Let me thank in advance all of our speakers and our forum producer, Amy McDonald, for assembling such an august group and for her Herculean effort to move this conference to this alternate location. And I particularly, again, want to acknowledge the Kennedy Library Director, Tom Putnam, who has been working on this program for several months and who should be the one up here making these remarks. So to save, save time, we will not have formal introductions of our incredible speakers, but brief biographies of each woman can be found in your program. I also want to thank Jill Kirk Conway, who has served for years and with great distinction as the Vice Chair of the Kennedy Library Foundation Board of Directors, a wonderful mentor for both men and women, 
alike, and who is a renowned historian, the first female president of Smith College, and a best-selling author. Jill will open our second panel with brief remarks. As I mentioned earlier, Radcliffe has served as our primary co-sponsor of today's conference, and I know I speak on behalf of my library and foundation colleagues in thanking their staff, their fellows, and faculty for helping to put this event together. We hope this will be just the first collaboration in a long partnership. So let me now introduce the Dean of the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study, Elizabeth Cohen. Thank you, Tom, for such a warm welcome, and my welcome to all of you for joining us here today. We at the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study are very pleased to be partnering with the John F. Kennedy Presidential Library and Museum and the Kennedy Library Foundation to reflect on the President's report on American women 50 years later. Thank you to everyone uh, on the staff of the library and the foundation who helped to plan this event, especially to Tom Putnam and Amy McDonald. We are very grateful to the foundation, to UMass Boston, and to the McCormick Institute for arranging this alternative site for us to convene. And my thanks as well to the staff at the Radcliffe Institute, particularly Rebecca Wasserman, who worked so closely and so well with the Kennedy Library on today's program. I hope we will continue to collaborate with the library in the future. Today's program is the first of what we had intended to be two consecutive events. But as we have all seen recently, the schedules of members of Congress are affected by many factors, and what we had planned to take place tomorrow at Radcliffe will now take place later this month. On October 31st at 2 p.m., we will welcome House Democratic Leader Nancy Pelosi to the Knopfel Center at the Radcliffe Institute, which is in Radcliffe Yard at Harvard. She will offer her personal reflections on the 50 years since the commission published its report, and she will engage in conversation with historian and former Radcliffe Institute fellow, Ellen Fitzpatrick, who is also here with us today. The event is fully subscribed already, but we invite you to sign up for the waitlist on our website, which is radcliffe.harvard.edu, and if that fails, to view the live webcast on the 31st, which you can access through our Radcliffe website. This conference today is based on the complementary strengths of the collections of our two libraries. While the official records of the commission are held by the Kennedy Library, the Radcliffe Institute's Schlesinger Library on the History of Women in America, with its major manuscript holdings on the history uh, of women, houses the papers of a remarkable group of women who served on the commission. Among them, the president of Radcliffe College at the time, Mary Bunting, civil rights activists Dorothy Height and Polly Murray, women's rights activist Margaret Rewalt, and Assistant Secretary of Labor and Director of the Women's Bureau, Esther Peterson. It was at Peterson's urging that President Kennedy formed the commission, and she donated her records from the commission and from her long career in public service to the Schlesinger. Among her papers is a letter she wrote from the White House in November 1979. She went back again and worked for Carter to Dan H. Fenn, Jr., director of the John F. Kennedy Presidential Library, after attending the library's dedication at Columbia Point. And I quote from Esther Peterson, I am still in a great state of elation over the experience not only for the beauty of the library and the significance of it, but also for feeling so close to those years that mean so much to me, end quote. Peterson then went on to write of her hope for, and I quote her again, a good working relationship between the Schlesinger and the Kennedy libraries so that the papers I have can be mutually of service to both, end quote. And with this conference, they certainly have. Today we have produced a brief video drawing from the collections of both libraries to tell the story of the commission and to help set the context for today's conference. 
It includes commentary by Ellen Fitzpatrick, professor of history at the University of New Hampshire, and Nancy F. Cott, who is the director of the Schlesinger Library at the Radcliffe Institute and a professor of history at Harvard. Immediately following the video, Tracy Roosevelt, Eleanor Roosevelt's great-granddaughter, will discuss her great-grandmother's leadership of the commission with historian Alita Black, professor of history and international affairs at George Washington University and founding editor of the Eleanor Roosevelt Papers Project. I'm so very pleased to be here today to see Esther Peterson's hopes for collaboration between our two libraries realized and to reflect on the historical significance of the President's Commission on the Status of Women with you. Thank you. We've heard a lot about President Kennedy and his women and very little about President Kennedy's other women, the women activists in the Democratic Party and in the, in the labor movement who actually influenced him to make history for American women. Kennedy owed a debt to women as voters, certainly, because they helped to put him in office. He particularly owed a debt to labor union women because the labor movement was such a strong supporter of his. By appointing Esther Peterson to lead the Women's Bureau, and then also by giving her a bigger role than that person had typically had, more of a policy-making role, uh, he began to address his debt to labor union women. And it was really Esther Peterson's idea that he should appoint a commission. In appointing a presidential commission on the status of women, Kennedy was calling attention at the very most senior level of our government to the problem that there was structurally within our society enormous inequality and discrimination against women that needed to be redressed. And that was a very significant thing to have done. He was absolutely devoted to the rights of working people. And it was natural, given the role of women in the labor movement, um, a role that they had carved out for themselves, that his path and their path would intersect. And they did in ways that, that changed history. One part of the suffragist movement, the minority part, the more militant part, had formed a group called the National Woman's Party and had invented the Equal Rights Amendment and it had been put before Congress as early as 1923. But most of the labor movement and working women and, and many women's voluntary organizations opposed this idea because they felt it would remove the protections, the sex-specific protections that working women had gained in various state laws. Women journalists, including Warren and his side when he was president, and would stand up at press conferences saying, Mr. President, what have you done for women's rights lately? President. The democratic platform in which you ran for election promises to work for equal rights for women, including equal pay. Now you have made efforts on behalf of others. What have you done for the women according to the promises of the platform? Well, I'm sure we haven't done enough and... Uh... <laughs> I must say I am a, a strong believer in equal pay uh, for equal work, and uh, I think that uh, uh, we ought to uh, do better than we're doing, and I'm glad that you reminded me of it, Ms. Craig. <laughs> Jacqueline Kennedy, his wife, was no fan of these women. She referred to them as the harpies who were harassing her husband at these press conferences, but they kept up the drumbeat. So the issue of advancing women's rights was in the air. The President's Commission was really quite innovative in being a blue ribbon President's Commission. Nothing like that had ever happened before. The membership of the Commission was very gold leaf. Robert Kennedy was on it, many very high up administration officials. 
had membership on it. Mr. President, I would like to thank you for being on this program. You probably don't... Eleanor Roosevelt was not a great fan of John F. Kennedy. People like Mrs. Roosevelt, who were devoted to liberalism, questioned how much of a liberal was John F. Kennedy. I'm wondering if American women are using their educations to the best possible advantage, or whether many women who don't want to leave their families, who don't want to be in outside work, um, still couldn't do a better job if they used their education better than they have. What do you well, think I think when that? you look at uh, well, Radcliffe uh, College, uh, that the curve of uh, academic excellence at Radcliffe is higher than it is at uh, Harvard, and therefore you assume that this is really the most highly developed student body. What happens to those girls two or three years later? They, uh, they get married, uh, many of them become uh, housewives, uh, and all that talent is, uh, it, well, it's used in this family uh, life, but is not uh, used outside. Now, of course, it is true that they work on school boards, they work in the League of Women Voters, they form, they work in church groups. In a whole variety of ways, they use this talent for strengthening the cohesion of our society. But I wonder whether they have the full opportunity to develop their talents. And if, as the Greeks said, the definition of happiness is full use of your powers along lines of excellence. And I wonder whether they have that opportunity. And this now, the secret behind the commission, historians know it well, of course, is that a major motive of it in Esther Peterson's mind was to bring up data that would show, yes, great improvements were needed for women, et cetera, but an equal rights amendment to the Constitution was not the way to bring those improvements about. The commission does point out how many laws there are that positively limit women's opportunities and recommends looking at all discriminatory laws at the state level. There was a ceremony in which he met with the commission and spoke very warmly about Mrs. Roosevelt. The New York Times had a headline announcing the commission's report saying, U.S. panel urges women to sue for equal rights. That was the takeaway message, which sounds radical. The report recognized women's work in American society was a reality. And it wasn't going to get less real as the decades unfolded. What was exceptionally important about it, and really had far more direct sequelae, was that the President's Commission sparked the formation of a commission on the status of women in every state. By 1967, all 50 states had these commissions, so it involved far, far more people who began digging up what were the discriminations, what were the inequities in their states. When the commission was formed, most people didn't think that differentiating between women and men in certain laws was sex discrimination. They saw it as sex differentiation, which was warranted in nature, in social practice, in custom. It was not until after Title VII of the Civil Rights Act was passed in 1964, where sex was a category not to be discriminated on, that the concept of sex discrimination began to be really alive in people's views. Robert Kennedy and John F. Kennedy did not live long enough to have to face the music that more radical feminists of the late 1960s were playing and injecting into the political conversation. Their lives predated the cultural changes of the late 1960s. They didn't live into the period when the issues that the women's liberation movement injected into American politics, issues having to do with private life, the abortion issue, they were men of an earlier era. The networks that the Commission created and the awarenesses that it stirred up by the data it found then rolled toward what became a huge grassroots movement, really 
unprecedented in, in American history. <laughs> uh, it's a, pro a pleasure to be here today um, to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the report issued by the Presidential Commission on the Status of Women. Um, and it's an honor to be here not at the Kennedy Library, but with the Kennedy Library and with its wonderful volunteers today. Um, beyond that, for me, it's, it's an honor to have a conversation oh, with Professor Black, who really knows so much about my great-grandmother, Eleanor Roosevelt, and um, can tell us more of, of the official side of her work um, for women. Um, for me, I know a little bit more of the personal side. Um, one, of, one story I'd like to share with you just as an anecdote before we get into the conversation is um, something my aunt told me, that as, as a young girl um, growing up, um, Grandmare, which is what we affectionately, affectionately call Eleanor in our family, took her aside and said to her, it's really important that you um, are involved in public life. It's really important that you run for a political office and that you always work to make people's lives better. Um, and she thought that this was something that, that Grandmare must be saying to all of, their, uh, all of the cousins. Um, and only as she got older and spoke with her brothers and her cousins um, did she realize that this was not the case. She only said it to the women in their family. <laughs> and so I'd like to learn a little bit more um, today about how, how she took that work public. Um, and first of all, how um, Eleanor's work um, really spurred the Presidential Commission and how she worked to make it a reality. Well, the film indicated, shall we say, um, the confrontational relationship that Eleanor Roosevelt had with Jack Kennedy. And um, she really did not campaign for the president at all until October 1960 because she insisted that he change his civil rights stance and that he publicly um, discuss McCarthy. And so she and Adam Clayton Powell and Herbert Lehman have a big conference in New York at the Abyssinian Baptist Church. And they come up with about a dozen recommendations that they want the president to endorse before, you know, to really say to the world, this is once and for all where I stand on civil rights. And President Kennedy, against the advice of his advisors, goes and meets with her, and she gives him the recommendations. And that's where he issues the famous declaration that I will ban discrimination in federally financed housing with one stroke of the pen. And so she campaigns for him then for the last 16 days of the election. And she goes to um, New York, uh, Atlanta, Detroit, Los Angeles, San Francisco, places where there are significant African-American populations and major labor unions. Because labor unions and uh, then John Kennedy had a very tempestuous relationship because of Bobby's relationship with the persecution of Jimmy Hoffa. And so Eleanor is designated to be the Kennedy emissary to African Americans and labor. And so her campaign is instrumental there for the president's victory, although he won for many reasons. But I think the one statistic that's very interesting is that, as you all know, he becomes president because he carries um, Illinois by 247,000 votes. He wins 267,000 African-American votes in Chicago. And Eleanor spends three days of the last 16 days of the campaign working with the NAACP, going to African-American churches, and holding rallies. So there was, a, uh, let's say, an IOU that was, um, you know, desperately earned there. And when President Kennedy appoints 
fewer women um, to presidential appointments than any president after FDR, Eleanor begins, there's no other word for it, to browbeat him into appointing women. And so she writes him letter after letter after letter of this is the woman that you should consider to be in this position. This is her phone number. This is her home phone number. You know, this is her work address. And finally, she writes him a four page single space typed letter with all of these names for women, you know, to be put in different positions. And she is very close to Esther Peterson. And so they, Eleanor expresses her great frustration to Esther about this. And then Esther responds to that by saying, let's have a presidential commission. But the thing that you have to realize about this commission was that it was 15 men and 11 women, six cabinet officials, all of whom were men, all of whom did not want to be on it. <laughs> and so, no, it's very true. I mean, the paper trail on this is, is very extensive. And so the role that Eleanor plays in shaping the commission is there are 20 presidential appointees, sorry, 15 presidential appointees, and 20 um, outside the government. And so she really pushes to get young people, especially young African-American women, that she has very close mentored relationships with, people like the incomparable Polly Murray, you know, one of the unsung women, I think, of 20th century politics, and the incomparable Dorothy Height. And so, and, and what she does with Polly is she, Polly's an attorney, and so she makes sure very deftly behind the scenes that Polly is the attorney that's, that's supposed to write the whole section on how do we deal with the Equal Rights Amendment and women's um, employment. So she shapes it behind the scenes and really pushes Esther out there to get the credit that Esther so rightly deserves. And you spoke a little bit about this, but um, what would you say the, the role and the importance that Eleanor put on underrepresented women, so minorities and women involved in the labor movement, how, how were they important to her? Well, one of the things that we're just now really beginning to understand um, about Eleanor Roosevelt in the Equal Rights Amendment is um, not only how her attitude changes over time, but the role that race plays in really shaping that attitude. Mm -hmm. And um, Eleanor just did not like Alice Paul. She just did not like her. And one of the reasons that they only, they only met twice, and they had a vicious conversation about race. And it's a word that Eleanor uses, vicious, which is, you know, as Anne will know, is a word that, you know, she very rarely used. And so she thought that the Equal Rights Amendment and, um, initially would not only undercut immigrant women, not only undercut um, working women, but was also a tool by some really educated white women who wanted to keep African American and immigrant women out of the labor force. And we're only beginning to learn this now by really looking at how Eleanor really um, argues when she's constructing the Universal Declaration of Human Rights about Article I. And Article I is all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. They are endowed with reason and conscience and should treat one another in a spirit of brotherhood. Even though it's Article I of the Declaration, it was the article that was the most difficult to adopt and get passed. And so one of the things that I um, have been really trying to uh, reconcile in my mind and try to find paper trails from people like Hansa Mehta. Yeah, and I was going to ask you a little bit more about Hansa Mehta and, yeah. and how she influenced Eleanor's thinking. And she, she was, I believe, the Indian and, delegate to the um, UN. And, and I think it's hard to underestimate the, the impact, Tracy, you're so right that Han Sameda has on Eleanor and her understanding of women and race. Han Sameda is the Indian delegate who is um, on Committee 3 of the United Nations, the Social, Humanitarian, and Cultural Committee, and ends up being one of the three women on the Human Rights Commission. And she, and she has a huge influence 
on Eleanor's understanding of the word man and used in the Constitution. Because Eleanor, before she meets Meta, assumes, like most Americans did, that it was the generic adjective. And so now that we're beginning to sort of reconstruct some of Hansa Meta's longtime relationship with Eleanor, it's just unimaginable to me that when she's talking about uh, women in the United States and just look at the women that she's trying to push, you know, she's pushing Latina women, she's pushing African American women, you know, the people who taught her about women were Russian Jewish immigrants, you know, Maude Schneiderman, Rose Schneiderman and Maude Schwartz. So she has a very different attitude about that by the time that commission has really taken off. And I thought it was so interesting to learn from you about Hansa Mehta and uh, the work on the Human Rights Commission at the UN. Um, but in particular, I was wondering if we could look at um, Eleanor's two books that really had a lot to do with women, women and how her views may have changed between writing them. So in, in 1933, I know that she wrote, It's Up to the Women. And then in 1962, just before she died, she was finishing Tomorrow is Now. And I'd love to know how her views of um, women's involvement in um, the political sphere and in, in rights in general changed over time? Well, they're, um, they're fairly radical. I mean, um, Eleanor, when she's, uh, she grows up in a very traditional home and she's radicalized by this one whose name is Mademoiselle Marie Souvest, who was her great teacher, who Eleanor later describes as a closet Bolshevik. That's her term and um, told her that the only way to really understand what somebody thinks, and I wish the members of Congress were listening to this right now, is to be able to argue with equal intensity the, and respect the position of your fiercest critic. And so it's Suvast who takes her out into the settlement communities. It's Suvast that says to her, of course you can stay with me in the summers and you can travel, but you have to remember that you were a guest so you can't just go to the opera in the theater. You have to volunteer in hospitals, in soup kitchens, in homeless shelters, and you must try to learn the language of the community that you visit. And so it's those early relationships with her that, that give her, the first thing that she really works on is the living wage. And the first group that she gets involved with are immigrant women you know, who speak German, who speak Polish, who were, and Eleanor's trying to figure out how to have conversations with them. And so at first she thinks, well, how can you be a mother and work at the same time? And so It's Up to the Women is a very traditional book, the title of which has been totally misinterpreted by people. She says, you've got to be politically active so that in fact you can maintain your home and make it safe. But by the time that she's dying, um, and she is dying during the commission, when the commission has its second meeting in Hyde Park, she's bleeding from the back of the throat. She has 102 and 103 fever. She's battling to stay alive, and she's battling to finish her last book, which is Tomorrow is Now, which is her manifesto. And I mean, she can't, she's dictating it. She can't hold a, a pen to, to write. And she's totally talking about women and young people, and that the parties have lost their way, that America is unready to face the social revolution, which is not only race, but gender, that young people have to be taught early to lead. You know, she says, we, you know, we cannot hide our problems like a skeleton in a closet, that staying aloof is not a solution, is a cowardly evasion. And so she goes from being this, you know, sort of traditional but radicalized progressive woman to seeing how um, many people are organizing in silos and not organizing together. Mm -hmm. And so um, when she testifies for equal pay for equal work, she's also testifying for migrant farm workers. And the Kennedy administration had a stroke when she brings in farm workers into equal pay for equal work. So in many ways, you know, women have to run for office, women have to leave. Her biggest regret is not going to college. You know? But what she's saying is you have to figure out how to balance now, not just to take care of your home, but to take care of your country. 
And during this time, do you think that her view of the Equal Rights Amendment was also changing? Yeah, it, it, it changes. Um, Eller was initially um, opposed to it because of the reasons that, were, that Nancy Codd and others articulated in the film. But as she begins to see women advance through the labor movement, as she begins to see women advance in the civil rights movement, she no longer actively opposes it. And when people ask her about it in questions, she says it's a matter of law. We're going to have to figure it out, you know, but that's going to be up to the country and not to me. So she's moving in that way, and that's why she really put Polly on the committee to really um, investigate the legal strategies because if you read the language of the report, you know, they talk about the Fifth and the Fourteenth Amendment, but Polly inserts now. We do not think an equal rights amendment is necessary now italicized, you know, because they want to begin the suits that are up. And Polly will say that once they got the first victory in the court against a state in 1971, that then you will have the legislative precedent that you need. And Polly was right, because you get the court, and then four months later, Congress passes the Equal Rights Amendment. And that's actually exactly where I was going with my last question. I, I wish we had more time, um, but in a minute we're going to take questions from the audience. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to ask as a final question if you could set the stage of the meetings that actually happened before the report occurred and how Eleanor was um, working with the other members of the commission sure, and where absolutely. they were meeting. Well, um, when the commission is, is started with the executive order in December of, of 1961, I mean, Eleanor and Esther jockey to see which women they want, some of whom the administration doesn't want, some of whom they take anyway, some of whom get axed. But um, it was Eleanor's idea to have the first major hearing mm -hmm. in the White House. And she had to have a personal meeting with President Kennedy to get that going. She also um, wrote about it in my day. And at that point, Eleanor Roosevelt was the third most syndicated columnist in the United States. And so her, you know, her articulation in very non-threatening language of the goals of the commission sort of reinforced um, President Kennedy you know, to do it. And then if you watch the first of that video, I mean, you can really see, him, see her skewer him on the role that, that women have in government. So she basically was laying her credibility out on the line for this commission at the exact same time that she was laying her credibility out for um, the Freedom Riders and when she's, to me, the thing that's so interesting is that a month before they have the second meeting at the commission at Valkill, Eleanor has traveled to Washington to hold um, the Kennedy, uh, US, Kennedy appointed U.S. attorneys accountable for not prosecuting um, the assailants of the Freedom Riders. So she's pushing him on both fronts with very different tactics. Fascinating to see how, how much there was going on. Um, at this point, we'd like to take any questions there are from the audience. There's a microphone right in the middle here. Oh, don't be shy. I want to suck <laughs> oxygen out of the room. I can go ahead and ask more questions okay. if we, <laughs> if no way, if everyone's too shy. Um, just to ask um, sure. two more questions. Um, well, one, just a, a, a question of my own. Um, many people have been um, saying that Hillary Clinton may run for president again in um, 2016. Um, mm -hmm. And I was wondering if Eleanor ever considered running for political office herself. Okay, um, that's a fabulous question. Mm -hmm. When um, within a week of President Roosevelt's death, she is asked to be Secretary of Labor, to run for Governor of New York, to be Senator of New York, to be President of your institution, um, and to run what's called NICPAC, the National Citizens Political Action Committee. 
And Eleanor turns down all of the political offices, basically because she says, been there and done that. I don't want to be holding to a party. I want to say what I think. And so the thing that she flirts with is Nick Pack, which is sort of like Move On, when Move On was really a force and not sort of a, a shell of itself like it is now. And, um, and she turns that down and she decides that she really wants her voice to be heard so that she will campaign for candidates, work with local party officials, um, work with unions, um, and work with civil rights organizations. The first assignment she accepts is to join the board of directors of the NAACP, where she will become a leading force in setting up the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. But um, of course, as you all know, Truman then asks her to join the first America delegation to the United Nations, which he does to get her out of the country. <laughs> because she, she's criticizing him so much. We forget that when Truman assumes the presidency within three months, his poll numbers were lower than the poll numbers of, of George W. Bush when he left. And labor is furious with him because he's doing, he's lifting, you know, rent controls and food controls, but keeping wage controls on. And so she's to the barricades against it, and then she goes to the UN, and where she is with the boys, as she calls them, and she ends up through a fluke um, debating Vashinsky, the great Soviet debater, over refugee issues, because the guys wanted to talk about the Security Council and the bomb, and nobody wanted to talk about the 40 to 60 million displaced people in Europe. And so from her performance there, um, 50 of the 51 member nations of the United Nations ask her to chair what will become the first United Nations Commission on Human Rights, and the United States is opposed. And so that we have to, she has to negotiate that, and then she's appointed unanimously and plays the major role in drafting the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. With four years of school, I might add. Not college, four hmm. total. It's really interesting what you say about her wanting to express her own views, because I know you can definitely see that in her writing, and it's something my dad enjoyed reading every day in her column, yeah. My Day. Yeah. Um, just as a final question, I wanted to ask you um, if Eleanor thought there was a difference between women's rights and human rights. Initially, yes. At the end of her life, no because she began to see, food. she thought that the most fundamental human rights were food, shelter, the living wage, and the right to education. And those were profoundly um, empowering of women, and it took her a while to get there. But by the end of her life, especially when she's continuing to work with the, uh, commission on, the UN Commission on the Status of Women, there begins to be some um, more cooperation on that. Great. Thank you so much. I really learned a lot. Thank you. <laughs> we can, we'll talk later. Okay. Okay. And uh, Professor Black will be around later um, if anyone does have more questions after this. Her attitudes on equal pay, etc., didn't just come bursting out full blown the beginning of the 60s. No, she was first. So if you time. go back in time to when her husband was the president. What was going on then? And did her attitudes, which must have still existed at that time, how was she using those attitudes on behalf of women in the 40s? Well, I will answer that in greater detail during the break, but I will give you one story. The second piece of legislation that FDR passes is, um, after well, the first piece after he closes the banks, is the Economy Act which cut the federal labor force by 25%, that automatically fired all of federal, federally employed women who were married to federally employed men. That afternoon, Eleanor Roosevelt holds a press conference and challenges the president's bills, and they end up writing dual columns in Democratic publications um, about this, and she has always been a champion of the living wage, and to Eleanor, the living wage is an equal wage. That's her quote. So thank you all very much. Thank you. Good job. Thank you. Thank you. Good great. job. Yeah. <laughs>